From the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight, and this is what we have for you on the menu. Parliament's Me Too moment. Victims of sexual harassment, including interns and assistants, share their stories online. Banning plastics, Europe's environment ministers take aim at your forks and straws. Saving Europe, Marine Le Pen lashes out at so-called enemies of Europe in Brussels. Brexit standoff, who will blink first in high-stakes negotiations between the EU and the UK? And mocking May, did Jean-Claude Juncker impersonate the UK PM? All right, it's time to meet our panel for tonight. We have, of course, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor here at Euronews. Darren, which of these stories are you watching closely? I think that's been Marine Le Pen. As Emmanuel Macron falters, uh, Le Pen sees uh, an opportunity. And given the fact that we are, what, seven or eight months away from these crucial European elections, uh, it's clear that she views an anti-EU argument as the way forward. Interestingly, though, she doesn't think that Steve Bannon, as part of this plan to unite uh, populists, will be explaining why Indeed, later on. Indeed, said that thing in front of Salvini. Right, also joining us uh, tonight is Nina Sheikh. She is a political commentator and director of data and polling at Rasmussen Global. Nina, which of these stories do you like? Well, I think it's another crunch week for Brexit. And uh, as to who's going to fold first, I think I have a good idea. So, Oh, we'd love to hear that one. <laughs> yeah. And joining us also is Jeanne Pont. She's a parliamentary assistant and co-founder of the MeTooEP.com. I think, Jeanne, I think we know what you're going to be choosing for tonight. Absolutely. I'm going to speak about like, the MeToo movement and our movement of workers 12 months after the big international Harvey Weinstein scandal. All right which is, uh, in fact, uh, the story we're starting with tonight, because it brought down Hollywood heavyweights. It inspired a worldwide protests, and most recently, it shook America's judicial system to its core. Now, one year after the first MeToo hashtag began trending on Twitter, we are seeing a revival of the movement in this very building. Last year, MEPs passed a resolution to combat sexual harassment in the EU, and advocates are still waiting for it to be implemented. And today, Parliament employees launched an anonymous blog meant to, quote, break the culture of silence. Take a listen. In December 2017, I started my internship in the European Parliament. In the first days of my new appointment, I got into the elevator and inside was a man I did not know. He looked at me up and down and then proceeded to tell me that there weren't many beautiful women in the European Parliament and that since I was new, I should take the opportunity to taste his pancakes. He then told me that the pancakes should be eaten in the morning and that I should absolutely taste them in his place. I received an email once at two in the morning from a political advisor working at the European Parliament, known for his passion for lustful photography. The email, sent from his work email to mine, included a series of pictures taken of me at work without my consent or knowledge. The subject of the email? I have more pictures of you. I was a young male trainee at the European Parliament, fresh out of my postgrad studies and excited to get involved in politics for change. During a group off-site, I was too lenient with the open bar and ended up more under the influence than I usually allow. A friendly man followed me all night and his bravado grew as the hours passed. Drunk and vaguely uncomfortable, I decided to go to my room and sleep. He followed me and begged me to be allowed to take the extra bed. Having no more fight left within me, I allowed him to take the extra bed in my large room and I went to sleep in my own bed. The feeling of someone touching me woke me up. I continued to push his hands away from my body and repeatedly told him to stop. At one point he finally did, reluctantly. I was sent on an official mission and decided to share my Airbnb with a colleague. One night I was in bed when I heard a knock on the door. My colleague walked in in just his underpants. I got angry and insisted he leave. Instead, he barged and got into my bed. I was so scared that I curled up in a little ball and begged him to leave me alone. But rather than respect my wishes, he chose to assault me. I filed a complaint with the competent authority on the 3rd of October 2017. I am still waiting for their answer. Well, these are very powerful stories. Jeanne, of course, I will start with you. Today, we have five uh, stories on the blog. You told me there are eight um, that, uh, that you have currently. How pervasive is this problem uh, in the European Parliament? 
So I think like those testimonies show two things mainly, that sexual harassment is still happening today, even though the members of the European Parliament have adopted last October a strong resolution with the chapter dedicated to the European Parliament, it's still happening today. And what the other thing those testimonies show is that sexual harassment happened to men and to women at the same time, even though the statistics show that 90% of the cases are the, the victims are women, it's also happened to men. And since this morning we received, so the blog is public from this morning, and since this morning we received eight new testimonies. On those testimonies, four are about men being victim. Mm. And we know, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a strong statement here, sexual harassment has no age. Sexual harassment has no frontiers, neither. Sexual harassment is not making a joke or trying to seduce someone. Sexual harassment is illegal. And we, as a movement of workers, we wanted to create a safe space for workers. And this blog is about that, sharing your testimony. Because when you share your testimony, it's the first step of getting better or recovering but, but that and not getting used to this kind of behavior. Yeah, that also ended with um, one of the people who shared their stories with you still waiting for yeah. an answer to a complaint. So how would launching a blog like this or telling these stories, making it public, push the cause forward and get some action done? We want to raise awareness on the culture of silence and impunity. And what we see, of course, like the main focus will be about the testimonies because they are strong and powerful. But on our blog, there is also all the resources for people in order to get help. Because we know that the most essential thing is to no one to be alone in, in this experience. So in this blog, you will also have all the contact, internal contact or external contact of association dealing with sexual violences. Mm. Or also how, do you, how, how to do to, to formally lodge a complaint because we also know this is really hard, qualifying yeah. sexual harassment. Yeah. And defining in your daily life what is sexual sure. harassment is a big challenge, and getting the evidence as well. Yeah, so Nina, what do you think is the biggest hindrance, I think, to, to, to getting some action on, on sexual harassment? I think it's, implementation. Yeah, absolutely clear that there have to be consequences for this kind of behavior. This is intrinsically about power structures, so it affects any age, any gender multiple industries, so just as we see it in politics, we saw it in Hollywood, unsurprisingly, we even saw it in the world of international development aid. So it cannot be that known perpetrators, for example, uh, there was a report that came out recently by the British government looking at ch the charity sector where known sexual uh, harassers were quietly moved on to another job because you know it was too much of a scandal to be associated with this kind of thing. So there have to be clear consequences. And I think what is also very important for this debate is to distinguish what falls under the whole Me Too sexual harassment yeah. um, big frame, if you will, because uh, an inappropriate comment, whilst obviously not appropriate, is not the same thing as violent assault. And I think there needs to be a terminology to deal with each of these offences appropriately. Right. Uh, and I think that's in some ways uh, part of the problem what is, with what has grown up over the last uh, year or so. I think in many regards the Me Too movement is about what you've talked about and in today in Parliament. It's clearly also part of this wider movement about power. And I think it's three things to a degree. It is about trying to correct the wrongs of history and the wrongs of what happened in society today, particularly that power imbalance that still exists between men and women. Hence why men like myself feel you know, uncomfortable talking about it, mm. but that is it. I think second of all, the Me Too movement to date has been about giving victims or survivors the chance to tell their story. Mm -hmm. exactly. And actually what has been interesting over the last year or so and what this blog is trying to do is to give people who have not had a voice in the past that voice. But third of all, this is about us as a society uh, trying to have a conversation about what we think is right and wrong, what is appropriate and not appropriate. And that extends obviously to things that are illegal and definitely wrong to things sure. where it's a it's big a gray area. Right. And I think in that part, one of the problems of the Me Too movement globally, not talking just about the European Parliament here, is that to a large degree men have been shut out of that discussion. Mm. And I think that's been to the detriment because ultimately not only are men sometimes the victims mm. of inappropriate behaviour, but ultimately they have to be part, part of the solution and sure. they have to be part of the conversation. I think to date right. there's been an attempt by some to essentially shut men out and I don't think that's helpful because ultimately this is a you know, it's a big societal shift that has to happen, right. but it has to happen with everyone. Mm. 
Absolutely. So men being part of the conversation, uh, a point being made. And there's also, there are other opinions, obviously, uh, in this debate, because support for the Me Too movement hasn't always been homogenous. One of the most well-known examples of this uh, is a backlash uh, to the movement. Uh, it was in an open letter to Le Monde earlier this year. It was penned by the actress uh, Catherine Deneuve and a group of 100 prominent French women. It said, what we are once again witnessing here is the Puritanism in the name of a so-called greater good, claiming to promote the liberation and protection of women only to enslave them to a status of eternal victim and reduce them to defenseless praise of male chauvinist demons. All right, um, I'd like to put it, okay, maybe Nina first. Do you, do you see where she's coming from? No, I think that's a ridiculous statement because I think whether you're too idealistic on either side of the argument doesn't make sense and you have to land somewhere in the middle. We know that sexual harassment is rampant all over the world. I mean, I come from a country where women are basically second-class citizens. And I, as I already pointed out, this has much more to do with the inherent structures of power. So even though there is a strong gender element to it, men and women are both you know, affected by sexual harassment. So I absolutely don't agree with this argument that by talking about sexual harassment, you're actually taking away women's agencies. Absolutely not. This is not only about women. It's about men and women. It's about s structures of power in society. And men have to be a part of this conversation just as women But you do. did make the distinction also uh, on, on drawing the line between what's definitely illegal and assault and something that, you know, it's inappropriate. Exactly. And I think the problem is that around this debate, too often you get ideologues on either side. So you have some people saying, like, you know, whatever is sexual harassment is all the same and they tar, the, they tar it with the same brush. So you have to be able to determine what the nuances in that argument are. And on the other side, to claim that this is all nonsense and you're taking away women's agency by talking about this and this is a chauvinist experiment is sure. also nonsense and, in my view. And Jeanne, I was reading some um, analysis on what the debate within feminist groups, so mm -hmm. feminism, some who would say, well, if you're being assaulted, then call the guy out for it. Don't be quiet. So how would you respond to that vision of, well, this is what feminism is about. Call him out. Be strong. Don't, don't hide behind. Yeah, but those victims are, are strong, like, because they are strong enough to speak out and to share their own stories. Of course, there is a problem of the l official lodge of a complaint, but that is something else. But I will not say, just to go back to what you previously said, like the putting the responsibility on the shoulders of the victims is a quite easy solution. Mm -hmm. To say to women who are victims or men victims of sexual harassment or sexual assault, you should speak out, you should complain, you should go to the police. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone can say that, but in reality, doing it, making the step of doing it is quite much more difficult. And I do think like, because I was really fed up hearing like, oh, it's about culture. Sexual harassment is about culture. For example, Catherine Deneuve is a French citizen. I'm also a French citizen. So I've heard so many persons telling me about French people like seducing other people. Mm. So maybe they are thinking seduction is exactly the same as sexual harassment, some, so arresting someone. The fight against sexual harassment is not about saying to every man you will not be able to seduce anymore or no, to but I think, I think there is, But I think there is a wider conversation to be had. Clearly there are things that are legal and illegal. Yeah. Um, and the things that are illegal need to be treated with the law. And if you've been a victim of that, you have to speak up and the authorities have to deal with it. That's what happens in our society. Now, there is currently a wider debate at the moment about what we view as society Absolutely. to be appropriate and inappropriate. Now, that's not covered by the law. And yes, there should be potentially mechanisms up to judge what, what wider groups, what, like, say, the European Parliament view as appropriate and inappropriate in a workplace. But we also have to understand that is a discussion. There is no... What is, what's appropriate mm. to you, Tessa, or to me, is different. And, th and that is why this conversation is so difficult. But it has to be, as I say, a conversation we all have. And this idea that because potentially someone views of what has happened to them as inappropriate doesn't necessarily mean it is inappropriate. And that's the really difficult thing. And I think we have seen examples recently um, where because this is not as you know, innocent until proven guilty. We have seen people who've been accused of things that certain people have viewed as inappropriate. They've been damned for it, but we've not had that discussion about, at a wider societal level, but what they've actually done is inappropriate. And yet their lives also then lie in tatters. It's right. very difficult. It's a good, well, but just we'll to go back this, to right, what I'll give you, you 10 yeah. seconds because you don't yeah. have much time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but just to go back to what you say, like, this is also the reason why we did not give any names on that blog. Neither are the victims, neither are the perpetrators, because we want to focus on right. the system and right. the structure of power.
and what's being done about it. Okay, good discussion that, that we're having, an important discussion, a sensitive one, albeit, but we must be having. All right, we'll have to move on now. Um, to There's a video of a, a woman pouring bleach on men's laps in Russia recently, and this went viral. Well, the problem is it was completely fake, and you may be surprised to learn who was allegedly behind it. Alex Morgan and our team in The Cube has been looking into this. Alex? Well, the video, Tessa, went viral globally. Let's just show you the video, picked up uh, as it was by media all around the world, taken from a, uh, an activist's uh, YouTube channel. Here we go. We have bottles of apparently bleach being poured on the laps of men on the subways in Russia. Now, this individual here seemingly pouring it on shocked men who are spreading their legs, something that's described as man spreading. And this video then picked up and shared around the world. The individual who claims to have filmed it, uh, Anna de Govluk, saying uh, that it was her video manifesto to tackle uh, what she called people trying to display their alpha manhood, saying if they try and do that on the metro around women and children, they deserve nothing but contempt. And saying here that uh, this video manifesto was shared and made possible with the, uh, the assistance of her friends. Well, what really made it go global was when it was picked up by In The Now and put into English, the English language. Now, In The Now, something to know about them. They are owned by Russia Today, and Russia Today is funded by the Kremlin. And there's a caption at the bottom here in that video which acknowledges some say it's all staged. So why is a Russian platform translating this video into English, pumping it out into the English uh, internet uh, sphere? and acknowledging that some people say the video is all fake. Well, uh, EU Mythbusters, that's a, a project that EU versus disinformation campaign set up in the European Union to tackle what they say is Russian disinformation. Well, they say this whole video was shared by the Russian media because it stirs up extreme views. And in the Facebook comments of that video, more than 21,000 of them, I can tell you, Many of them are too offensive to share. It is extreme feminist and anti-feminist views. And these researchers claim that is exactly what the Kremlin wants to do. They call it the, uh, the operating method of troll factories, saying this is just another example of regardless of whether the video is true or not, the Russian media will share it to get extreme views. They also say the video itself, uh, to bring up a quote from them, uh, mirrors uh, a sort of hostility in Russian state television to uh, what they say is the Me Too movement and political correctness in the West. So the claim here uh, is that this video is staged and then shared, regardless of it being staged, by Russian media to get a reaction. And I'll end very quickly on Anna responding to these claims on Instagram. YouTube, by the way, have taken down her original video for breaching their guidelines. Well, Anna here, she mocks Western media. This is the sun she's quoting here, saying, well, I thought my critics in Russia were the biggest idiots. Now I believe it's Western media. So she obviously rejects those claims. But needless to say, this video has stirred up extreme views and reminded people there was a lot of hostility to the Me Too movement in Russia itself. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Alex and the Q team. Nina, this is right up your alley. I'm going to ask you this. You've been, you know, you, you watch Russia very closely as well as uh, the, the Internet. I mean, this what this manipulation, what was the objective? And, and it, <laughs> this know? is straight out of the Russian playbook. I work with the former secretary general of NATO and we're looking at how the information space is being weaponized. Russia seeks to, uh, which it has been doing, by the way, in covert foreign influence operations around the U.S. elections, around European elections, around Brexit. It is in Russia's interest to seek to divide and conquer its, uh, well, not enemies, but, you but know. But on an issue like the, the Me Too movement or feminism. Absolutely, but the, these uh, are the issues that have become so highly partisan in Western politics now, issues around identity, issues around race, issues around immigration. So just and, as, and gender and gender. Absolutely. So the, as these issues become more and more, um, you know, uh, associated to certain political tribes and people completely associate their identity to that political tribe, whether you say you're a liberal or you're conservative, these are the defining issues. And of course, Russia is able to do this because there are splits in our Western democracy. So. I expect so a lot taking more advantage of, of exactly. just divisive chaos, divisive confusion issues. and cause lots of trouble. Or another divisive issue. Well, let's <laughs> turn to Brexit, because uh, despite some optimism in Brussels and London, a deal is still not certain. DUP leader Arlene Foster and SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon, they're both setting out their uh, stalls in the negotiation trade off. Let's get the latest now with the Brexit brief. Alive. 
just days after tens of thousands took to the streets of Edinburgh to show support for Scottish independence. Nicola Sturgeon takes to the stage of the Scottish National Party conference in Glasgow. Going into the conference, the SNP leader once again raised the prospect of independence, contrasting it with political deadlock in Westminster. Meanwhile, the leader of Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party is in Brussels this week for three days of Brexit talks. Arlene Foster is meeting with Michel Barnier and representatives of EU member states. There's hope of a compromise on the Irish border. A breakthrough there would clear one of the last obstacles to a Brexit deal. And back in London, a boost for Theresa May. The percentage of Brits who have confidence in Theresa May's ability to get the right Brexit deal is up by 22% from last month and since her speech at the Tory conference. That's according to a poll by ORB International. Although a slim majority still thinks she won't deliver. The British public is perhaps hoping that May's famed fancy footwork can clinch a Brexit deal. Darren, you've been doing the rounds here in Brussels. I mean, should we be optimistic? What's going on? Well, it's really interesting. I think the mood music that we saw at the weekend from people like Jean-Claude Juncker and Donald Tusk, I think was a bit of political uh, game-playing by the European Union, almost to put the pressure back on Theresa May uh, in order to try and mean that if there was no deal, it would be, of course, her, her fault. I think interesting today we saw the DUP leader, Arling Foster, here in this parliament, uh, where she gave a press conference and reiterated her red line, as she put it, uh, that there, will, there should be no border in the Irish Sea, separating Great Britain uh, from uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, her point is that she does not want to see any extra checks. Now, there had been a thought process that we we're going to see an alternative plan on this issue of the Irish border from the British government in the next couple of days. There are now rumours that that might not happen because ultimately the DUP, bizarrely, even though they only represent 30% of the people in Northern Ireland, even though Northern Ireland as a whole voted to remain inside the EU, if they do not like this deal, they have got the votes in the British Houses of Commons to, to essentially dump any deal that Theresa May signs with Michel Barnier. And that's why they matter. And as for Scotland, clearly one politician's problem is another's opportunity, and uh, Nicola Sturgeon clearly views this as a chance to ramp up the independence argument, though there were a whole series of uh, opinion polls at the weekend. It still shows that if there was a referendum tomorrow, for example, uh, independence would not pass, but if there was no deal when it comes to Brexit, it might just do. So that's how big the stakes are for the British government. I'll go to Nina because you said you had an idea on who's going to blink first. I'd like to know. Well, <laughs> I, think, I think as has consistently proven to be the case in the past two years of negotiations when you pit one against 27, the 27 tend to win. Uh, so I think the UK will blink first. I mean, but I have to agree with what Darren is saying, despite, you know, all the will they, won't they, no deal kind of talk. I think we're edging closer to a deal because fundamentally, ultimately, it is in everyone's interest to strike a deal and one of the biggest sticking points in the talks, that's the question of the Irish border, if there is no deal, that is not resolved. So I think where we're heading really is towards uh, the position where the UK kind of remains in the customs union. Yeah, so if you call the bluff of Theresa May, she said, oh, we're going to leave, but actually no. She's just, yeah, and I, 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 I think, I think right, people, seconds. people talk about it, and, and it's an actual thing to say that, of course, it is in everyone's interest to get a deal. Economically, Britain would be damaged, the EU would be damaged. But Brexit, is a, in Absolutely. its sense, was people voting against their economic self-interest to yes. a degree, mm -hmm. and there are people perfectly willing to say, we do not not want a deal if it's not a good deal, even if, again, it does Britain or indeed the EU more damage. So, you know, it's still really and difficult to judge. this discussion's not over because really the whole is, week is about really Brexit. Is. <laughs> All right, we have a lot more coming up on raw politics. As Europe moves to ban single-use plastic, we ask, is it a significant step or feel-good policy? And uh, is Marine Le Pen eyeing a political comeback by attacking so-called enemies of Europe? That's still to come. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, the stakes are high today in Luxembourg as the EU's top environmental body meets to vote on a range of issues that could transform Europe's ecological future 
or not. Environment ministers arrived for the EU Environment Council meeting, often in large German cars and people carriers. They're hoping to hash out a plan to tackle climate change by curbing CO2 emissions. The Commission and the Parliament are still at odds on what the target should be for 2025 and 2030, and the German automotive lobby has a lot to say on the topic. Austria's Environment Minister will also tell her counterparts that she is keen to wean Europe off of single-use plastics. Well, let's uh, look at what they're proposing for this so-called plastic span. The aim is to target the 10 single-use plastic products most often found on Europe's beaches and the seas. The list includes 10 items from cutlery to balloons and tampons. Together, these make up 70% of all marine litter. But a ban is only being proposed for three out of the 10. And for the rest, the suggestion is that producers will take responsibility for the cleanup or the uh, raising public awareness about the environmental impact. All right, so joining me, in the studio to weigh in on this. We have our political editor. He's still here with us, Darren McCaffrey. We have uh, Green MEP Marco Affronte and Kevin Stairs from Greenpeace and the Rethink Plastics Alliance. All right, I'll start with you, Kevin. Um, as we saw, is, this is not really a ban across the board. Is this enough or is it just feel-good policy? Right. It's a step in the right direction, but it's certainly not enough. There is far too little ambition in the proposal. Uh, when you look at the seriousness of our plastic pollution crisis, it is completely out of control. Uh, we have the equivalent of a garbage truck, a municipal garbage truck, packed full of plastic waste being dumped in the oceans every single minute. This has got to stop, but fortunately there is a good solution. Uh, if we look at your uh, bathtub overflowing, you don't start mopping up the water uh, before you turn off the tap. So the first thing to do is start to reduce the production and consumption of plastic, and in particular, the single-use plastic items, this throwaway culture has to end. And it is possible through reduction targets and bans. So the proposal really needs to be improved. Hopefully the Parliament can do that. Uh, what, do you, what do you think, Marco? Are we focusing on the right uh, solution? You're asking people, OK, uh, change your lifestyles. But actually, we have really powerful lobbies that possibly prevent bigger, bigger uh, policies getting through. Yes, I think that is one of the problems. Of course, when, when you talk about the discussion within the European Parliament, of course, we have to listen or we listen anyway to, to the, the stakeholders and the, and the, the lobbies. And just an example, uh, we have, as you said, a list of, of uh, products that should be banned after the, this directive uh, will become a law. And uh, in the last weeks I met, for example, uh, a representative of uh, uh, firms in Italy that produce only and exclusively uh, sticks for the coffee. So they say, OK, the, the directive is good, but you can derogate on the, on the sticks coffee. And another one, uh, I, I met another one that say, OK, the, the, the directive is good, but you, you have to derogate on the, for the um, uh, catering because the catering is not possible with plastic. It's not like this. It, we, we cannot work like this. This is a change, man. This is something that we want to change in people. We want to change in mind of people. So we have to start strong. And then the people can change also the way that they consume uh, products. Right. You know, 87% of Europeans said they're worried about the impact of plastics. But I mean, when we see that list, we go, what? I need to stop using cotton pods? I need to yeah, stop well, using... The, the, the bizarre thing is, that even though there are powerful interested force here, and I think 300,000 Europeans are employed in the plastic industry, it's worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of euro a year. I think actually the kind of single-use plastic campaign has been quite effective at reaching the public, having an impact. Um, I think people do now think about single-use plastics. Clearly, businesses, to a degree, are on board. We've seen Starbucks and other good coffee retailers uh, now uh, charging uh, for you to use a single-use cup. Uh, we have seen supermarkets or the government force supermarkets in certain countries to introduce a bag tax. Uh, or a levy on plastic bags, which again is reduced at the level. I think people, actually it has hit home because people do realise that they have been quite wasteful. The problem is, uh, yeah, how far can this go? Um, and for everything that you want to ban, you have to have an alternative. People are willing to swap or to make compromises, but it's very difficult to give up anything uh, wholly. And that, I think, is the troublesome nature exactly. uh, for environmentalists, but also for, for legislators. All right, there's, there's something else I'd like to, to bring up, because let's take a look at how much uh, of these proposals would actually tackle the problem of plastic waste. Where does most of the waste come from? So, so far, packaging 
is far and away the biggest driver of plastic pollution. It made up 59% of plastic waste in the EU in 2015. Next was electronic equipment at 8%, followed by agriculture, uh, automotive and construction industries, which made up 5% each. Kevin, uh, I'll ask you, packaging, why don't producers just stop p producing uh, well, these plastic packaging? That's what should happen, actually. We need alternative systems. We, we, there's a lot of unnecessary packaging, first of all, that should be banned. And no, it is not a question of moving to alternatives, the alternatives yeah. because the, no packaging is an alternative as well for many of, of these products. So but, but, but it's interesting that? though consumers go into supermarkets and sure. we all say, sure. like in the old days, we go and we pick up, um, you know, carrots and vegetables and whatever. And some people do. Lots of consumers, when they've got a choice, actually like it being wrapped up. We've got this sense that it's cleaner and it's mm. better for you. Mm. Um, and that's a bigger thing about trying to change people's minds. And that's a far bigger task. And we also have the consumer, I think, or people need to feel like they're buying into this as well. Mm. They, they, you cannot just go around banning things because you will face a backlash from people. People need to feel they're part of this process. Well, there is a... a contribution that has to be made by the legislative body, the governments, the industry, <clears throat> and the consumer. That's true. But the, cons the consumers are actually being forced to address this issue uh, where it really should be the corporations, the industry responsible for producing, especially single-use plastics. All right. Uh, there are alternative delivery systems, for example, that obviate the need for the packaging. And, right. and this is what's necessary. But without the legislative mandate, the, the industry is not changing. We're running enough. out of time, but Marco, very, very quickly, I'll just give you 10 seconds to answer this. I mean, are we focusing, okay, there's plastics, but then we have coal dependence. We have the automotive industry. Are we not giving that enough attention as well? Oh, for sure. But anyway, plastic has become in the last weeks, in last months, uh, under the attention of the public. That's why we are here discussing plastic. That's why the, the Commission made this kind of step further. We need to, to do the, the, Is it a the, the same. Is it the big yeah, industries? Not a distraction, but oh, we right. need to do the same also for other items, for, for sure. It, it's always it's a really obvious thing because anyone who's been to a beach this summer, gone right. for a swim, they will have seen plastic mm -hmm. in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it's something that actually you can't really get away from. Mm. Right. OK, uh, still a big, big issue uh, here, uh, the environment, uh, definitely in the European Union. All right, but we'll move on. Just a few weeks ago, the EU launched proceedings against Hungary amid concerns over the erosion of democracy in the country. And controversially, the UK Conservatives supported the Orban government in the vote. Well, that caught the attention of Hillary Clinton, who was speaking today at Oxford University. And here's today's You Said It. It's disheartening to watch conservatives in Brussels vote to shield Viktor Orban from censure, including British Tories. They've come a long way from the party of Churchill and Thatcher. Strong words from Hillary Clinton there, but the Tories were thinking about Brexit and trade, weren't they? Yeah, yes, of course. So the Brexit is a, such a big issue, so I think that... Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't reply directly to, to your uh, question, but I don't know if at the moment, if we ask the, the people of the UK, they are still uh, happy with the decision that mm. they took uh, uh, some years ago, because uh, you know how, how many consequences is. is Was getting. there merit in that decision? That I, I, I think what's interesting is um, actually almost the regret within the Conservative Party really? about mm. allowing this to happen. They faced a big la backlash, not least from the Brexit supporting conservative press in the UK who thought, you know, the mantra of Britain may be leaving the European Union but is not leaving Europe and it should stand up to people like Viktor Orban mm. um, actually has rung through and I, I think probably in retrospect the MEPs possibly regret it. Now, the Conservative Party said that they make their own decisions, Downing Street were not involved in telling people what to do, but clearly you're right. Uh, you know, Brexit had a part to play in the mindset of their MEPs, who currently, it must be said, Britain are looking for all the allies they can get inside Indeed, the European Union. optimistic this week, but that week I remember in Strasbourg, there's a lot of uh, pessimism around Brexit. All right, we still have a lot more uh, for you after the break as anti-Macron protests come back to France. We gauge the prospects of a political comeback from Marine Le Pen. Plus, did Jean-Claude Juncker mock UK leader Theresa May during a press conference? That's coming up after a short break.
Welcome back to our politics. So French President Emmanuel Macron hasn't had an easy time of it recently. He's faced scandal after scandal, lost countless cabinet ministers and seen his popularity in a freefall. A cabinet reshuffle later today was supposed to draw a line under all of that, but it seems people might not share his enthusiasm. In major cities across the country today, crowds of angry people rallied against Macron's social policies. People of all ages, from students to retirees, turned out in force to attack policies they say target the weakest and the poorest. It's the first nationwide demonstration since June when strikes crippled the country. All right, uh, Macron's uh, recent um, woes come as his, it appears his main rival, Marine Le Pen, is back in the headlines. Yesterday, flanked by Italy's Deputy Prime Minister Matteo Salvini, the pair set out their joint front against Brussels. They said the upcoming European elections would be a revolution. Or, nous sommes aujourd'hui à un moment historique. C'est l'histoire avec un grand H qui va s'écrire au mois de mai prochain. C'est euh, l'émergence euh, d'une Europe des nations, d'une Europe euh, du respect, euh, d'une Europe des protections, c'est-à-dire celle pour laquelle nous nous battons depuis de nombreuses années, notamment avec euh, Matteo Salvini. I nemici dell'Europa sono coloro che sono asserragliati nel bunker di Bruxelles. I nemici dell'Europa dei popoli europei, della felicità dei popoli europei sono quegli Juncker, quei moscovici che hanno portato precarietà e paura in Europa e si rifiutano di mollare la poltrona. Stiamo lavorando per restituire il futuro a 500 milioni di cittadini europei, francesi e italiani in primis. I'm joined by Darren McCaffrey, our political editor at Euronews, and Nina Schick, she's back, director of data and polling at Rasmussen Global, and Marco Affronte, an Italian MEP with the Greens. And Nina, I'll start with you because you did work on uh, Macron's campaign, I believe, right? So now, uh, a comeback for Marine Le Pen, and what would that mean for Macron? I think Macron inevitably was facing an uphill struggle because, you know, he swept the Elysee on this promise of hope and change, much like Obama. So his task, you know, what he had to deliver was, first of all, not deliverable for one man and one government. So he's already fighting uh, a losing tide with that. And second, the, the, the problem is that a lot of the big reforms he had envisaged um, when it came to Eurozone reform, didn't happen because Germany was not in the right place, the EU was not in the right place. So it's very easy for his political so it's enemies. it's perfect for Le Pen again. Yeah, of course it's perfect for Le Pen. But interestingly, I think as somebody who's analyzing how Russia is, what they're doing against the West, this is almost a tactic out of Russia's playbook. So if your politics has no hope for the future, you need to create an enemy. And where Russia did that for the West, the populist parties are, of course, doing that to the EU. Of course, the EU has inefficiencies. Of course, the EU as a body and an institutional body can be improved. But the, to blame the EU for all of a country's woes like Marine Le Pen or mm. Salvini are doing is just... But, but, but isn't, isn't part of the problem that Macron has not helped himself? I mean, newspapers are now doing the top nine Macron gaps. I mean, yeah, undeniably, I'm not saying that Macron's had a great time. And, uh, I mean, he, he does seem to be... His pomposity, shall we right. say, does not <laughs> seem to help him, whether... <laughs> it, it, but, I mean, what I'm saying is that he was facing an uphill battle. Circumstances in the EU did not go in his favour. And finally, let's not forget that every French president after a while starts to become exactly. unpopular. Like did friend. you say strikes in France? <laughs> oh, never, never heard of that. And, you know, well, what's interesting, you say that it, this is an opportunity for, for those who are pushing a populist agenda. But then here we saw Marine Le Pen distancing herself from Steve Bannon, who wants to unite, you know, populist populist groups in front of Salvini, I mean, yeah. they're not looking very united, are they? I mean... No, they, they are trying to build something, I think, but they are not a very clear plan. They are not something in mind that is a real construction of a future for Europe. As Salvini said, we are, we are working for the future of Europe. Do you think Europe. he will that, align with true. Steve Bannon? Sorry? Do you think uh, Salvini will align with Steve Bannon? <laughs> it's, 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 it's always difficult to say... Uh, what think uh, what is thinking is Albini? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if, if we see some some kind of uh, um, uh, payback in in, the, in in this alliance, he can do it. But at the moment, I don't I don't think it is an option. 
but, but I don't know. I still, really, it's, it's difficult also for me, as, I mean, I'm Italian, as okay. Salvini, to understand what is in the yeah, mind of Yeah, I find that interesting. What game do you think uh, Le Pen's playing by distancing herself? Well, you could say in some ways it's quite ironic uh, that, uh, you know, nationals, nationalists across Europe are trying to unite on a European <laughs> level uh, to take on uh, Europe. Um, yeah. I think in part they, they do kind of need to organise and Le Pen is right in the sense that uh, the next year's elections are going to be crucial, yeah. these European elections. Clearly populists across Europe see this as a chance to essentially mm -hmm. get inside the beast of the European Union mm -hmm. and try and destroy it from within. Um, but Bannon, in her mind, isn't part of that because he's American. He's not French. Well, that is That's, a good um, Pen, reason, I suppose. European. All right, it's time for today's uh, raw moment. And there's mounting evidence that Brexit negotiations could turn into a, a dance-off between Theresa May and Jean-Claude Juncker. Let's take a look. Look at that. Uh, this, is, this has become a signature now. In the, I, I think it's great. And clearly, looking at Theresa May's <laughs> pool ratings, <laughs> dancing even very badly as Her the way to go forward. Up. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, maybe, maybe the next EU Council meeting should actually be an episode of Dancing with the Stars. Um, and we can settle the Brexit negotiations on the dance floor rather than uh, sat around a rather dull table. I bet you a lot of the public would be up for that. I mean, Juncker's on his exactly. way out. Exactly. He you doesn't be care. Up for that? <laughs> I mean, please be up for that. <laughs> no, okay, I'm, I'm on board. We're you. looking forward <laughs> yeah, yeah. to it. All right. Thank you very much to our panel and thank you for watching us on World Politics. We'd like to hear what you're talking about. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Tessa Ercilia and at Euronews. You can also use the hashtag World Politics. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow.